Yeah, yeah, I'm going to give you a test after this is over. And ever who wins the test, we'll get it. And if there's more than one winner, we will work that out. So, actually, when I put this together, I have 244 slides. Now, that's not possible. So, actually, I could make about six presentations out of this. We're going to have about uh, 40 slides. And when we look at self-propelled vehicles, I think the first one was in 1478. This is Leonardo da Vinci. And these are a couple other efforts. 1804, this, there was a steam-powered. This is uh, electric. Uh, this was an electric tram in 1881. This was a three-wheeled cart for a Frenchman. This is often considered to be the first electric car by Thomas Parker. He was the English Thomas Edison. And when they ask, did the first electric car have a tiller or a steering wheel? No, it had a reins. <laughs> and here is uh, Carl Benz's. But the reason I'm here is this beautiful woman here is Carl Benz's wife, Bertha Benz. Bertha was a venture capitalist from an early age, and she funded Carl's machine shop before they were married. And she funded all his car activities. In fact, all the patents are in her name. And in 1885, Carl built a car, and in 1888, she hadn't had any return on her investment yet, so like a good venture capitalist, she took matters into her own hands. So Carl woke up one morning, and she's not there, and there's a note on the, on the table that reads something like this. Hi, honey. I went to see Mama. Took the car and the two oldest boys. Why are you when I get there? Love, Bertha. Mama lived 66 miles away one way, and you have to realize that 30 miles was a full day trip at that point in time. She's going twice as far. And she's going in an automobile that nobody's ever done this before. She's the first one. Okay? And there aren't any gas stations. I mean, actually, it burns on Ligeron. That's the cleaning fluid for the tubes for the chemists and things. And so the way you get it is at an apothecary shop or, <laughs> or at the drugstore. So they, they celebrate this, and they reenact it every year. And this is where she made her first stop for Ligeron at this uh, drugstore. See, this is ILIs of the wheels. This is her. That's her elbow, and that she's holding her bonnet on. And these are the two oldest boys. And part of the sculpture is over here. This is a milkman that's running behind them to give you an idea what time she got there in the morning. But see, this car actually didn't have a gas tank. It had more like a float. So she had to stop about four times in the 66 miles in order to get there. Plus, you know, there weren't any roads either because there weren't any cars, weren't you? And so it wouldn't pull the hills. So the boys pushed her up the hills. And uh, she b burned the brakes up. So she stopped at a shoemaker shop and redesigned the brakes with a leather band. And that was the design that we went with for years after that. And she had a fuel problem, and she fixed that with her garter. And when she got home and says, honey, you got to fix this thing. you got to put gears in it. you got to see. So she's, so Bertha has, was a real contributor to making cars practical, made the first road trip. When we look at automobiles in the United States, if we go from uh, 1895 to 1930, there were 1,800 more than that manufacturers in the, Uni in the United States. And over 100 of those were in St. Louis. Now, in 80, 95, there were only 300 automobiles in the whole United States. And that number was at 8,000 in, in, in 1900. 40% of those were steam, 38% were electric, and only 22% were gas. Now, the cars at that time were just play toys for the rich. They were toys for the rich. And what they would do is they would go out and race. This is a gas, this is a steam, this is an electric, this is an electric. Does one of them look different? That's Walter C. Baker driving his number 99. He set the world land speed record, broke it by 15 miles an hour at 80 miles an hour in 1902. 
okay? But that didn't hold up for too long because people like this came around. This is Henry Ford. This engine is up over a thousand cubic inches, even though it's only 60 horsepower. So this is the kind of thing they were racing with. See, when they talk about it's just a motor with wheels on it, nah, we've done that a long time ago. Now, in 1914, <clears throat> Walter Baker, when Ford came out with the assembly line, he sold his line, and then he retired to his ha hobby. Guess what it was, Rebecca? Ham radio. Oh. So, can you see the ham radio operator in this lineup? So the number of cars steadily increased in the United States. And by about 1910 or so, the cars were now the domain of the well-to-do for transportation. So they went from being a toy for the rich, for the domain of the well-to-do. And then there was a Selden, that's another presentation. This is part of the politics and the self-starter was introduced in 1912. Ford introduced the assembly line in 1913. And the assembly line revolutionized what went on in automobiles because your thing just cut off my, my lines here. So it broke it down into 45 steps. It moved six feet a minute. And it reduced the time it took to complete a car from 12 and a half hours to 93 minutes. And the limiting factor was on how fast you could produce these cars was how fast paint could dry. And not all paint dries at the same speed. And Japan black dried faster than any other paint. And that was the reason you could only get a Ford in black until 1926 when DuPont came out with lacquer. Now, one car came off the assembly line every three minutes. Now, what did all of that mean? What all that meant was, you can't see this, but the average car at that time cost $2,600. And the first one off his assembly line cost eight twenty-five. Do you think that made a difference? Henry Ford made the electric the car available to the masses. In fact, that price got all the way down to $260. Huh? How does that compare to today's value of the dollar? The, well, the average worker at the Ford plant could buy a car with four months' salary. I don't know. I don't know what the dollar conversion is. Okay, so it was Henry Ford and his production line, and him changing the economics that allowed the car to become the car for the masses. And in 1914, Ford produced almost a quarter of a million cars, and that was almost half of all the cars produced in the United States. In 1914, there were 1,700,000 cars in the United States, and it wasn't until 1914 that the number of gas cars exceeded the number of electric cars. Now, as far as electric goes, you would think that this was a death blow to electric cars, and this is the end of them, and you never see them again. But that should not have been the case. Because if you look at this, the New York Times, January 11th, 1914, Henry Ford said, within a year, I hope that we shall begin the manufacture of an electric automobile. I don't like to talk about things that are a year ahead, but I'm willing to tell you something about my plans. If fact is that Mr. Edison and I have been working for some time on electric car, and it goes on, OK? So. Drum roll, please. I was introducing the 1915 Ford Edison electric vehicle. This vehicle, that's uh, Fred Allison, uh, the chief engineer, and they had $1.5 million in, in their money designed to build this thing, and this car was going to sell for $600 because this is the end of 1914 and the other was the beginning. So this is the same price the gas cars were selling for at the time. This was, when this was going to come out, they were going to be selling for the same price as the gas cars. It was going to have a 100-mile range. It would run 25 miles per hour, and it had the nickel-iron Edison batteries in it. And this is what the Edison batteries looked like. Question one. I just pulled in inflation calculators, so 
that car, $14,483 today. Okay. And that's, that's an economy, compact economy car today. Okay. So here is Edison with uh, Colonel Bailey testing out his nickel iron battery, the Edison battery. And uh, so they ran a thousand miles. They did a thousand mile run. They would stop and recharge it at night. Uh, you would go to a city that had lights because that's what, that's what they use electricity for. And they, the guy in here is an electrician and he would wire in. That's how they would recharge the batteries. And here is um, uh, Jay Leno, and this is that Baker that he was writing on the first slide, and he's got the battery out of that car. This is the original battery, and Jay Leno said, if you just f flushed the battery out and put in new electrolyte, it was as good as new. So these were long-lasting batteries. They had twice the range. They had half, you know, they lasted twice as long, and they were quite a bit lighter, and they lasted forever. So that's a pretty good battery. But you'd like to know, whatever happened to that car, that battery, why didn't it come up like it should? Well, let's take a look at it. Let's, here's my report card. Let's look at the science. It was going to be as good as the cars that are out there. You know, and the cost is it's going to be in the same price range. Now, special interests are a nightmare. And if you want another presentation on that, I can do that. And the opinion was, OK. You know, so this is a $600 car selling for $600, 100-mile range, 25 miles per hour. And when we look at what happened, why this car didn't come into being, well, it's special interest. There's the lead cab truss. There's a Selden patent. There's the Exide battery litigation. There's the bicycle cartel. Believe that. There's the oil cartel. And what happens is that all these people had a smear campaign that they worked against the Edison battery. What kind of things did they do? Why they sabotaged and falsified battery tests. They bribed Edison, uh, Ford's employees and they betrayed him. And there was a mysterious fire that burned up Edison's lab. And then the war came and the assembly line that Ford was going to build these cars on was reassigned for war production. So after the war, we found out that the opinion had shifted down towards being negative, And the game was over by that time. Now, do we know th wh what happened with the electric car at that time? The answer is no. We don't have any way to find out. But we know we never had a chance because of special interest. So this car was actually killed by special interest. Now, jumping forward to today, there are two forcing factors necessary to drive electric cars. One is pollution, and the other is the cost of gas. And if we take and we look at uh, Los Angeles, and we look about pollution, what we have is we find that automobiles contribute a large part to that. And what we further find out is that of the top 10 worst cities in the United States for pollution, California has the honor of having six of the top 11. Now, to put this in perspective, New York City is number 17 on the list, and a city that you all know and love is number 25 on the list. And if you're interested in the 50 worst cities in the United States, this would be where they are. Now, if we look at global pollution, what we have if we look down here at the United States, and we can look at Europe and see that Europe is pretty much twice as bad as the United States. China is four times as bad, and India is six times as bad. <clears throat> <laughs> so let's take a look at China. Welcome to China. Walk on the streets of China. China is the reason, now you know why they're interested in electric cars and solar power. 70% of their electricity in China comes from coal. It's estimated that over 4,000 deaths every day in China are attributed to pollution. And if that's deaths, just think about the health problems that are associated with it. And if we look at gasoline prices, well, that's the United States right there. Now, let's see. We have uh, Mexico, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Ven 
those are cheaper than us. Basically, we're the cheapest in, quote, the civilized world. Everybody else's gas is more than us. And on the end here is Norway. And would you believe that Norway has the highest density of electric cars in the world per capita? So let's look at battery development. Let's look at 100 years of battery development. Here's the Ford Edison with the nickel iron batteries. And here is EV1. You've all heard of EV1. It came out in 1996. And they're using, excuse me, lead acid batteries. They have a 70 mile range. They get 80 miles per hour. Uh, it looks to me like they went backwards. But please don't think that these, the nickel iron batteries aren't available. Because you can see right here that the Iron Edison, this website, you can call that number. They're the largest distributor of nickel iron batteries in the United States. But anyhow, these people didn't know about that. In, in 96, they came out with lead acid. They made 660 of these. And in 1999, they updated it to nickel metal hydride, which is a first cousin to the Edison battery, by the way. And they had 120 miles of range. There weren't just the EV1, there was also the RAV4. It had nickel metal hydrides, had a 95 mile range. There was the Nissan Ultra, and there was a Ford Ranger, which came out with lead acid batteries that were updated in 2000 to nickel metal hydrides. You know what happened to all these cars? They were crushed. And there's a whole lot of politics involved in what you heard in the media is not the truth. And if you want to know about that, I can give you another presentation. But if we look at the EV1, let's look at the report card of the EV1. Well, the science, well, it sucked. Uh, the cost, they said they were going to sell these for $34,000, but that wasn't true. You have to understand that like six years before, GM came out with this car called the Impact look just like this. And they said, we can do this, and we're going to be third, fourth, and we're going to do all this. And, and, you know, he said, this is something we're thinking about, and we might be able to do it someday. And California says, my God, that saves our butt. You will build them. And GM says, oh, shit. <laughs> because they weren't really willing or able to build the cars. So here they are. The cost, GM couldn't build them for $34,000. That was their pipe dream for the future, that they weren't bringing it out until they could. Uh, special interest, see the, the cost was really more than, um, you know, so the government was wanting to support this thing in, in California, but please know that the oil industry and the automobile industry, see GM's in a GM will make a car that runs on peanut butter if they can make a profit doing it, and they don't care. They just couldn't make a car that ran on electric and make any money, and they did care. So what, sap what happens with the uh, EV1? Well, the science sucked. That was it. The cost sucked. Uh, the special interest sucked. The opinion sucked because electric car is just a less of a car than what you had. It's just a golf cart. So... The, it didn't make it on anything. It was still born because it was a premature birth. The manufacturers clearly were not ready, willing, or able to make this car. And just because the government said you have to do it, that doesn't mean they could do it. Because uh, it's the batteries, Spanky. You gotta, it's all about the batteries. Don't forget that. It's about the batteries. What we really need here now is we need another Henry Ford. Fortunately, we have another Henry Ford. Oh, his name's Elon. He came back as Elon Musk. Let's look, I, I think to understand what this guy is doing, you have to understand who he is. At 12 years old, he wrote a program, computer program called Blaster that he sold for $500. And then after he got out of grad school, after he got out of college, he wrote a program called Zip2 which is a yellow pages for businesses that he sold to Compaq for $341 million. And, and then instead of spending his money, he says, hey, I got another idea. So he wrote a program. Oh, his, his brother in this 
Elon is the nerd that sat down for three years and wrote this thing while his brother was the front man. That's Kindle. He's quite a guy too, by the way. Here's Kindle when he's younger. This is what he looks like about two years ago. So Elon then wrote a program called PayPal. And he sold it for $1.5 billion. So after he sold PayPal, he said, I wonder what's been going on in the world since I've been gone, because he'd been gone for nine years. And he says, I wonder what space is doing. I wonder how that's going. And he went out and they weren't doing anything. And so he said, well, maybe I could kind of, I have an extra $100 million here. Maybe I could put that in, encourage them to do something. And he decided that that wasn't going to work. And he says, well, the problem is that space costs too much. It needs to be cheaper. I'll show them how to do it. So he started SpaceX. Now, what's SpaceX now is the largest space subcontractor in the world. And the reason that they are is because when they bid on something, their bid is about half of everybody else's. How are they able to do that? Because SpaceX designed their rockets to be manufactured. And the other guys designed their rockets and they just figured out how to manufacture them afterwards. He figured out how to manufacture them first. And then he's recycling the rockets on top of that. So that wasn't enough to keep him busy. So he went and checked on electric cars and he found this group called Tesla Motors. And he joined them as their main um, financer. And then he became the CEO. And then he talked to his... So he's financing all this stuff out of his pocket. And then he talked to his two cousins and said, you know... We need solar. So if you guys, here's my idea for Solar City. If you guys run that, I'll finance it and be on the board. So that's Solar City. Now, since then, Solar City and Tesla Motors are one and is now called Tesla Energy. If you saw the movie Iron Man, it was modeled after Elon Musk. And he made uh, an appearance in it. Now, there's one other thing you need to know. You see the guy on the left, on the right over here? Peter Thiel. He is the guy that put together Trump's technology group. He was the primary investor in PayPal. So, Elon's got a pretty, and he's, he's on the technology team also. But through Teal, he's got a close connection into Trump and what's going on. So let's look at Tesla Motors. And they had a master plan. See, everybody else just tried to build a car. And it wasn't possible because we're here and we need to be there. What did I say? Well, anyhow, their mission statement is to accelerate the world's transition to a sustainable energy. And what... The mission is, is to build an affordable car for the average man. Same thing that Henry Ford said. But he's got more of a problem than Henry Ford got because of something we'll call the technology adoption life cycle. When we look at a technology adoption life cycle, it kind of breaks down into five steps. You have the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and the laggards. If we look at cell phones, when cell phones came out, they cost $4,000, they weighed 10 pounds, you carried them in a backpack. All they could do is call on the phone, maybe. You know, and look at them now. They, they do everything. So where does this car fit into this program here? Well, it fits right in here at the early majority, eh, optimistically. So we're up here, and we want to go down here. How do we get there? Wait a minute. Toys, domain of the wealthy. So, they brought out the Tesla Roadster for $110,000. This is a toy for the rich. And then, in 2012, they brought out the Model S. This is the transportation for the wealthy, for the well-to-do. And then we'll count a car that costs $35,000, which is the average selling price of a new car. That's why they chose that. So that was their plan. This was their plan from the beginning. 
when people said we look at the, the, the Roadster, they said, oh, yeah, well, it's nice, but nobody could afford it. There was no, the intention was that the people that bought the Roadster, that Tesla could learn how, what they needed to know to go to the next step, and the people that bought the car would finance the next step. And the same, you know, with the Model S and the. Isn't that the way most things work? You start out with something, VCR, first VCR came out. Yeah, but everybody, but you're competing against a finished product with your gas automobile, and you have to start yeah. from the beginning with an electric car. Uh -huh. So here is the Roadster. It had a range of 244 miles. It went 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. It cost $110,000, and it had something that no other sports car had. It had instant acceleration because that's what an electric car does, and it was very quiet and smooth. And they sold 2,400 of those, and that funded their next effort. So let's take and look at the report card for the, for the Tesla Roadster. It was a $110,000 sports car, and actually it was competing against cars that cost $110,000 because it's against the high-end Porsches and things like that. So the science, the science was, okay, what this is is this is a Lotus Elise roller. That means Lotus gave them the car and it had no motor or running gear in it, and they did electric conversion on the car. That's what the roaster was, electric conversion. And the cost was the same as the other cars, and the special interests kind of supported it, and the opinion sucked. Because everybody said electric car is a less of a car, it's a golf cart. And part of the mission of this car was to change people's opinion from being negative down here and move it in a positive direction. Now, how do you do that? How do you take something that is undesirable and make it desirable? Oh, that'll work. <laughs> so, let's look at the Tesla model lineup. For, you know, so there's the Model S, that's a full-size luxury sedan. There's the Model X, that was a full-size luxury SUV. There's the Model E, that's a mid-size luxury sedan. And there's the Model Y, the mid-size luxury SUV. Now, this was the original plan and how Elon announced it. But... You know, Ford actually owned the rights to Model E, so they wouldn't let Tesla do that. So Tesla says, okay, look at Tesla. See that? So Tesla says, okay, three. <laughs> well, we have since changed that, and yes, it's Model 3 now. But everybody knows that's hot. This is, this is the new sexy. Got it? So... What happened is, is they were able to take this car and make it something that was actually desirable. And they moved public opinion from very negative to in a positive area. So this car clearly was a success and it did what they wanted it to do. It moved public opinion, it taught them what they needed to do in the next step, and it financed that operation. So that's the Roadster. Now let's take a look at the Model S. Well, the Model S came out, and as soon as it came out, it won a bunch of awards. It won Motor Trend Car of the Year. It won the Automotive Magazine Car of the Year. It won the World Green Car. It won the magazine, 10 Best Inventions, Consumer Reports, the top scoring car ever. And on safety rating, it scored a 5.4 on a scale of 0 to 5. And it broke their machine when they wanted to crush it. The machine broke instead of the car. So, what's inside of this thing? Oh, I'm glad you asked. This is what a Tesla looks like inside. It's built like a skateboard. These are where the batteries are, and the motor and converter are back here, and this is just the front suspension. And everything above there, Hans, the designer, says, that's the opportunity space. So, you'll never guess. So, here's the battery that's in here. You know, I said we didn't have any development on batteries. Where was the development on batteries? Was it in car? No, I don't think so. It was in computer electronics, in laptop computers. Ha ha, this is what the battery is in the thing. It's an 18650. The old laptop computers, when you put your battery in there, if you break it open, this is what's inside. That's what they use. 
And they took that, and they have 16 modules of 444 a piece. No, there are 7,104 of these in a Tesla. Now, if we look at, well, this is a Chevy Volt, and it has 288 of these. And these are cells, and they're similar to this. This one's out of a Prius. I'm going to pass these around. There's 28 of those in a Prius. And in I have a Prius, and I'm happy with it. it it's interesting. Is it as efficient as this one? Is it how? I'm glad you brought that up. I'll get there. So what do you do? you got to charge these things. These are superchargers that Tesla's installed all over the country. And they're adding to them. This is what they were before the Model 3. With the Model 3, you won't believe what they're going to do. But this is currently what it looks like right now. There's one in St. Charles. Looks like this. This is the Columbia site. This is the one in Independence in Kansas City. You notice this by Bass Pro Shop. What they do is they place these by places where you're going to stop for a while and eat or something. This one's in Minor, and it's associated with Ruby Tuesday. So... Currently, you can take and go there, and the, the stations are like 100 miles apart, and you can get 120 miles of range in 20 minutes, and you can't eat lunch in 20 minutes. You know, so if you just stop and eat lunch, you're covered. Norm, Norm, they, in Walla, they have it in every bandana. <laughs> now... Uh, that's going to change a little bit. But anyhow, you all heard of Dieselgate. Well, part of the punishment for Dieselgate is they're going to have to add to our charger network over here in the United States. That's the good news. The bad news is most of them are going in California. So, let's look at the facts. Well, the Model S is the fastest production sedan in the world. You see this? That is an Alfa Roma 4C Spider. Uh, an Italian supercar. And in behind it, we have a Alfa Roma 4C Spider on a trailer being pulled by a Tesla. And if you would race those two, guess who would win? This is the picture they took at the finish line. So the car is unbelievably fast. Um, it has handling because the battery is so low, equal to the best sports cars in the world and as a sedan. And the ride is on a par with a Rolls Royce. And it has seating for five adults and two children. And interior space of a full-size SUV because there's nothing in there. Everything above the skateboard is opportunity space. And it has the highest safety rating ever, like I said. And it has twice the MPG of a Prius of a Prius, twice it. Let me show you why that is. You see this? This is what a Prius does. This is power to the wheels. They lose 18 to 25 percent in a conventional car. This is what a Prius saves. Wind resistance. The design of a Prius is, is the second best in the world. Uh, the rolling resistance, they run special tires and they use regenerative braking. So instead of losing 18 to 25 percent, they lose 10 percent and they make a smaller car. So Tesla does that too. Electric cars do that too. But that's what the Prius does. But the Prius doesn't. It has a regular motor in it. A gasoline motor is only 22 to 24 percent efficient. And an electric motor is like 90 percent efficient. What does that mean? That means that we only lose 10 percent here. If we come down to parasitic losses like the water pump and the alternator, uh, these are mechanical devices on the gas cars. They're electrical devices on an electric car. They only lose about 3%. If we come down to idling losses, the only thing you're running when you're parked at the, waiting for the tra traffic light is your computer. You lose less than 1%. In the drivetrain, you don't have any drivetrain in an electric car. You have the motor and you have a reduction gear. You have no transmission. You have no clutch. So that loss is only like 2%. So you find that... A true electric car has about twice the efficiency of a Prius and about four times the efficiency of a conventional car. So, also, it has half the maintenance because it has a tenth of the parts. 
So if I look at this another way, it's number one in speed and handling equal to, it's number one in handling and it's number one in ride and it's number one in seating capacity and it's number one in interior space, number one in safety, number one in fuel economy and number one in maintenance. Duh, make a guess what the best car in the world is. I bet it's a Tesla. I bet it's an electric car. It's the world's best luxury sedan because it's an electric car, not in spite of that fact. Because all of these things are possible only because it's an electric car. So that is why it is the best selling luxury sedan in the world. Did you know that Teslas outsell Mercedes, BMW, and Audi combined? And there's a reason for that. And they're the best selling electric car and they do no advertising. And you see the red states? Would you believe this? It's illegal for Tesla to sell a car in any of the red states, thanks to the dealer network. And in spite of that, in spite of no advertising and not being able to sell them in half the states, they're the best selling luxury car in the United States and in the world. Huh? Because the franchise laws, uh, in protecting the customer. Yeah. Now, the Tesla has the highest customer satisfaction of any car in history. And incidentally, the number two car is a Chevy Volt. And they have the highest resale value of, it, of any luxury sedan in the world. In fact, the only car in the world that has a higher resale value is a Toyota Corolla. So let's look at the Tesla uh, scorecard. The science is better. So it's a $70,000 luxury car selling for $70,000. It has a 265-mile range, 0 to 60. The original went for 5.4 seconds. They're currently down to 2.6 seconds. And they're running 10 second, they're in a 10 second bracket running a quarter mile. And you can put 120 miles of range on the car in 20 minutes. So the science is better, the cost is the same, the special interest is all over the board. You know, what the government tells you and what you read in the paper and then what happens behind the scenes are vastly different. And the public opinion is positive on the car because it's now a car that people desire. So I would have to say that this is a success. So, but incidentally, if we jump forward to 2017, uh, this price now is 69500 for the basic model okay. with a 60. They get 120 miles charged in 20 minutes. How much of a power station are you going to need at your home to be able to plug that in? No, you can plug it in. You can put anything you like at home. This is just when you're on the road. When you plug it in at home, you have a charging station at home, and you plug it in, you got all night to recharge, so you don't care. Charge it from zero up full. Uh, the last little bit takes longer. And the idea is you actually don't want to charge it all the way up because it's hard on a battery. And you're not going that far anyhow, so you don't care. But, it, but the answer to the question is about an hour and a half. That's from z roughly. Yeah. Yeah. And that is because the last part of it takes longer than the first, you know, it charges slowly for the last. That one's out of the Prius. This one is out of a laptop, which is like the Tesla battery. Yeah. So how do you get? So now we need to look at the Model 3. But, you know, you can't get from the Model S to the Model 3 without going through batteries. Because the problem is that to build 50,000 Model 3s, you would, that would require all the lithium ion battery production in the world. And somebody's already buying that. So if you want to build an electric car, you better have your own, you better have the batteries in your back pocket. <laughs> and you better be serious about doing that. So let's look at the Gigafactory. It's in Sparks, Nevada. This is what it looked like two weeks ago. This is how big it's going to be. It's only about one-fifth done right now. And they're in production. They're making batteries for power walls. And they're making the new 2170 battery, which is just a little bigger than this, 50% bigger than this one. 
And what, they're, what this is going to do, what this is huge about, is this is going to lower the cost per gigawatt hour for batteries. Lowers production cost. So being able to sell an electric car and making a profit is all about how much your batteries cost. And if you're buying your batteries from somewhere else, I bet you can't make any money. But if you're making your own batteries and you build them on top of a lithium evaporation pool, because that's how they do it, they don't mine it like they told you. Lithium is all over the world. The reason it was only in China is because they, they were building the batteries in China, so they just found something close to do it. But it's all over the world. And the Sparks uh, factory was specifically chosen because it's easy to have lithium production there, and it's close to the Fremont factory also. So here was their production schedule of when they would have this thing in full swing. The original schedule was that they were going to be able to do um, 500,000 vehicles by 2012, and now that's been set ahead to 2018. Okay, so that's the, the Giga Factory. And incidentally, uh, Giga Factory 2 is the one that we're doing with Solar City, and they also want to do one in Europe one in China, and one around Virginia on the East Coast. And he's got out, he's talking to people right now to build two of them, the next two. So let's look at the Model 3. This is what the Model 3 looks like. It's about 80% of a test of a, so this is a mid-size luxury sedan. And this was the day that they revealed it in the middle of the, re towards the end of the reveal, and there were 129,000 reservations that had been made. What's the reservation? That's somebody that says, I would like to buy one of those cars, and here is $1,000 of my money to hold me a place in line to get one. And right now, there's over 400,000 of those reservations for these cars. Now, this really shoots in the butt the manufacturers that were saying, we're not going to build electric cars because if nobody wants one. Because that's what GM and the company said when they got rid of the EV1. Nobody wants one. Well, somebody might want one. Nothing like this has happened in history. And this has brought about a flood of cars. So these are cars, electric cars, that have been announced because of the Model 3. These are by other manufacturers. That's a Remax. That's an incredible car. That's faster than a Tesla. See the solar panels on the roof? This semi, since Tesla's going to do a semi too. John Deere even wanted to get in on the, in on the uh, deal here. But these are all cars that have been announced since, um, except for that one, since the uh, Tesla Model 3. This is the Chevy Bolt with a B. And here is the star, the class to pick it a litter. And when people look at this car, I have people say, how does the Model 3 compare to the Chevy Bolt? Well, I have to tell you, the Model 3 is going to crush it. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at their report cards. The Tesla, they're going to come out in early July, and they're going to go to the um, SpaceX and the Tesla employees. They have a bot. 15,000 reservations between them. And then they're going to go to the West Coast and then to, to the early Tesla owners. That's, so you get the bugs out with some people. That's a little sympathetic. And then it'll go to the rest of the world and then move west, east from the West Coast. So it's a $35,000 mid-sized luxury sedan selling for $35,000. It has, we don't know what the range is going to be. It'll be at least 215 miles. It'll be at least under 60 seconds, 0 to 60, and we know that it'll charge at least 120 miles in 20 minutes. But Tesla's no, announced new superchargers. So let's look at the report card. Uh, the science is clearly better. The cost is the same, even without the $7,500. The cost is the same because it's competing against a BMW Model 3. The special interest, that's iceberg. You, what you see on, anyhow, I don't have time to talk about that. And the opinion is very positive, as you can see on this car. 
When they went to 400,000 reservations, this car is a huge success. Now let's look at the Chevy Volt. It's a, some compact economy car. That's a $20,000 car. Selling for $37,500. Okay. A 238 mile range, zero to 60 in seven seconds. It'll charge 60 miles in 20 minutes. Chevy dropped the ball there. Uh, I don't think you're gonna wait for that. So the science is fine. The cost is, well, I got it. Will we revisit cost? The government support is here, but GM is over here. And the reason for that is they can't build this car for 37,000. They're, they're not making any money on it. Some time ago, Bob Lutz come out and said, I don't know what Tesla's doing because they can't make money on the Model 3. Well, I have to tell you, they can make money on the Model 3. The, with cars, the way the manufacturer is set up is the manufacturer makes about 10% and the dealer makes about 15%. Tesla decided they need to capture that 15%. That's one of the reasons that they market their own cars. And Tesla has been running between 20 and 25% profit on all the cars they've been building since the Model S. And the reason they're showing a loss is because they're building all those superchargers, they're building a new plant, or they're spending a lot of money on building out. So the truth is, this is a compliance car. They're selling this car to publicize themselves and to handle the uh, carb uh, requirements. So they'll be out in California and places like that. If you want one, they will be hard to get in this part of the country. So it's a compliance car. This was an exciting car, this Clemens Portal. If you saw this thing, this is a fabulous car. If they build this, this car can compete head to head with a Tesla. Only it's a concept car and they can't build it for that. And they're waiting because Chrysler has said, I don't see how anybody would build an electric car because you'd no way to make money on it. But so that's the Tesla Model 3. So what we're interested in is something we call the price tipping point. What does that mean? It's about the price of the batteries. It's all about the batteries. Remember the batteries. At what price do batteries have to get to? We started at $600 a kilowatt hour when we did the Model S. What price do batteries have to get to before a gas car, an electric car, an economy car? These were, Tesla was doing this with luxury cars. If we're getting down a car that's going to sell for $14,000, batteries are going to have to be cheaper than they are now because Tesla hasn't done it because you can't do it and make money. At what price do batteries have to get to for the cars to cost the same? And the answer is $100 a kilowatt hour. Why, that's fine. Next question. When will that happen? For Tesla, it's 2020. And that's because of the Gigafactory. Now, everybody else's cost is more than that. So they can make electric cars and they can design them, but they haven't got access to batteries that they can put into cars and make a profit on them. So they got a problem. But there are a couple... Um, there are two companies that actually have done that and are somewhere in a reasonable place. Just remember, it's the batteries. It's the batteries. And the people that don't have a situation like Tesla, because Tesla did the whole thing like Ford did to bring costs down. And the other people are just trying to buy them from somebody else, and that's not going to work. So with this tipping point, what this means is right now, it's all about gas. And starting in 2020, it's going to be about electric. And that's a good thing because the price of cars are actually going to go down because now a car is an electronic appliance like these cell phones. So the question, the question everybody should ask is on the top of your mind. He says, well, that was all nice, but the car, it's the battery spanker. Remember, it's the battery spanker. I said, okay, I remember that. So if we look at this, 
if this is 100% battery capacity, and this is zero miles on the car, and then we say, how does the battery degrade? You know, it starts out at full power, and it's going to run down quickly, and then maybe have a useful life, and then drop off to nothing. What's that look like? Well, it looked like some, maybe something like that. So, but what, is the, what does the data say? I, I'm glad somebody would ask that question to me because this is the data. This is what happens is this is a, a Tesla fanboy that has a couple thousand Tesla owners that are reporting in to their mileage on the battery so that we know exactly what the performance is and what's happening here. In the first 20,000 miles, it degrades pretty much, and then it levels off after that. It's right there. That's the average thing, and it levels out at 93%. And we don't know what's going to happen, but there's no reason to believe that it won't go just for the life of the car, no matter how long the car lasts. Now, there's this perception, and there is the reality. And between perception and reality is opportunity. Let me show you what I mean. This is a car off a site called Cars for Sale, okay? And this is a 2013 Tesla, and it has 102,000 miles on it. And people don't like to buy cars with 100,000 miles on them. So that's 65,000 miles more than they expect to have on the car. And because of that 65,000 extra miles, you can save $20,000. Here's another car. There's three opportunities that you have. One is a lot of miles. And this one, uh, this one here is a salvage title. People don't like to buy salvage titles either. You see, this car only has 20,000 miles on it. 20,000 miles is all it has on it. And you can get it for $28,000. And it's a 2013. And the only thing wrong with it, it has a salvage title. Because it was hit in the back and they replaced a couple, they replaced some sheet metal. And now the car is $27,000 cheaper than it should be. Because it has a salvage title. <coughs> what was the story with this one? There's three things. This is this 13,000 miles. Um, I don't remember. But um, if it's a salvage title, people don't like that. People don't like, um, I can't remember what that one was. But anyhow, there's actually opportunities out there. Those are, those are actually desirable cars. Let's look at the Chevy Volt. Uh, the Chevy Volt has OnStar on it. And so all the cars that have OnStar, we have all the data on those cars. And if we look right here, I can set this up any way I like, but I set this up for the most total miles on a car. And this is Eric Brimmer's uh, Chevy Volt, 2012. He calls it Sparky. He's a GM employee, and when they closed his plant, he had to either decide he was going to move or find out how he was going to go 110 miles one way to work. And Sparky was his answer. So he has, this was a week and a half ago, he has 377,000 miles on that car. <laughs> now, that's a lot of miles. What he does is he drives 110 miles to work. He charges to work, and he drives 110 miles home. And what are you looking at here? This top line shows his mileage, accumulated mileage for that time frame. The green shows how much of that he drove on electric, and the blue is how much he drove on gas. What is the point of this chart? The point of this chart is, is you can see that this is a straight line and his battery is as good as it ever was. And that's what he's been telling us. And this is a graphic picture to show that the Chevy Volt battery is probably going to last longer than Tesla batteries. And the reason for that is, is you don't, you have a capacity for the battery, and you don't use the whole battery. You use a percentage of it. 
you never charge more than 85% in a Chevy Volt and you never discharge it more than 25%. Because if you discharge it more, it degrades the battery quicker. Or if you charge more, it degrades the battery quicker. With a Tesla, you can charge 90 or 95% if you need to range. So you don't always want to charge all the way up. You only want to charge what you know you're going to need. So if I'm going across country, I get in here. Incidentally, it'll tell you where all the superchargers are. And if you're driving and you're in danger of going out of supercharger range, it will tell you and show you where the superchargers are and tell you how to get there. But anyhow, so you're going to pull up at this one supercharger. You pull up at the supercharger station. You still have 75 miles. It's 125 miles to the next stop. You only have to put 50 miles on it. 50 miles is 10 minutes. You don't have to step there very long in order for you to make the next supercharger station. But anyhow, we're talking about Chevy Volts. So that, that's 377,000 miles. And the battery, we do not know of a Chevy Volt battery failing yet. So here's an example of some Chevy Volts. Here's one with 100,000 miles on it. That's 62,000 miles more than the average. And because of that, you're going to save about $10,000 on it. Here's a 2011 for under $9,000. And those, those 100,000 miles didn't hurt it. When you buy the car, you're going to buy it for the shape the car's in and, and expect to get a discount for the battery, but know that you're getting a deal for that. Here's another one. Auto evaluators, this is on Watson Road. They specialize in, in these particular cars. And uh, this one is 11,000, and it has 88,000 miles on it. Or Nissan Leafs. With a Nissan Leaf, here's one for six grand. It's a 2013. And now, the Leaf batteries aren't as good. They don't take near as good a care of them. Uh, there, we're expecting a range probably about 150,000 miles on them. But this one only has 22,000 miles. Uh, it has a range of 85 miles. Uh, you give up, you lose 25% of that when it's really cold, so it doesn't go near as far. So you, but I drive 85% of my miles in electric, and I only have 40 miles range. So if you want a new Nissan Leaf, you can buy one for 14,435 today. If you go over to Bomberito Nissan and ask for Todd Eversgard, he had three of them when I talked to him. <coughs> so, I bet you didn't know that between 20 and 30 percent of all electric car owners have solar panels on their car or offsets. And this is Tesla's new solar roof panels. So, they don't look like you have an erector set on your roof. And that was for existing construction. If you're doing new construction, Tesla has come out with the new solar batteries. This is an artist concept. This is a new house. Two, this two is. Two questions during the break here. The, the range, does that depend on how fast you're going? In other words, yes. If you're going 60 miles an hour, you get X amount of yes. time. And yes. And the wind resistance increases to the level of four for when you go faster. And the second question is are there alternators or recharging? items at the wheels that would charge the battery while you're driving? No. 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 Because you would pay for that and there would be a loss in it. What we do have is regen braking, which I showed on that one chart, you know. Yeah. One of the things about driving an electric car is you almost never touch the brake pedal. The only reason you need to touch the brake pedal is you want to come to a complete stop. When I want to go faster, I push it down. When I want to go slower, I let it up. And it recharges my battery when I do that. Okay, and I can almost come to a stop by just lifting my foot at the right time. And, you know, so I would have to make a rolling stop to not use the brakes. Um, Eric Brimmer's car, yeah. he has 85% brake life left on his car right now. But he's mostly highway miles. But mine's just like that. They're, you hardly use them enough to keep the rust off the rotors. Summer to winter and spring, and you know, depending on what your accessories you use. 
uh, uh, yes. Uh, that's why most electric cars have heated seats, because it is more economical to heat the seat, to, to heat the seats than it is to heat the whole car. Now, uh, we run our car in what I call wife mode all the time. <laughs> and I'm old. I really appreciate it. You know, I do it for myself. And I can just tell her, honey, I'm doing it for you. But no. <laughs> but anyhow, it, the heat is there instantly because it's a resistance heater. And then the seats come on. I say, oh, I love that. Heat to defrost in the winter. Yeah, well, that's a heater thing, too. Yes, you do lose miles. I... During the summer, I can get 45 miles range in my, supposed to get 38. I can get 45 miles. I've had 62 miles out of it before with my other one. Uh, but during the winter, I'm looking at 25 miles. But what difference does it make? Because I got a gas engine in there. What the Volt is, is it's a transformer. When you start out, it thinks it's a wannabe Tesla. And I can go 40 miles as a wannabe Tesla. And then the battery says, uh-oh. And then seamlessly, miraculously, it transforms itself into a Prius Grande. Now, instead of getting 100 miles at a gallon, I only get 35, which is quite a bit less than a Prius. But it's a, it's a nicer ride than a Prius. It's a lot like a nicer ride than a Prius. We pulled a trailer down to Florida. We won 3,100 miles. The trailer only weighed 1,000 pounds. I went over to Cumberland Gap. I settled on 55 miles an hour. I was just enjoying good company. I had no idea why everybody was having all these problems going up this hill. I didn't know I was going up a hill. It didn't act like a hill. And then we topped the hill, and I saw the runout lanes. And I says, oh, I know where we were. It did a nice job of coming up the hill at 55 miles an hour. And then it went down the other side just like that. It never got over 56 miles an hour. All it did is charge my battery, and I'm pulling a trailer. Best tow vehicle I ever had. But anyhow, so when we look at this, Tesla has come out with solar shingles. They're tempered glass. Oh, the first person to make one of these self homes was Edison. And this is the home, and this is the windmill, and it'll charge batteries with his nickel iron batteries in about four houses, and then those batteries will run the appliances in the house and the car. So that was a long time ago. This is what it looks like. From the street, it looks like that. From the sun, it looks like this. They're etched, and so it looks differently from where you are. They're made in four different styles, Tuscan tile, slate, grooved, and smooth. And here is a house that it's on. This is a slate. Here is a Tesla car, here is a charger, here is a power wall, and there is the solar roof. It looks like that. So where is this going? Well, probably the person best capable of answering that would be Andrea James. She is a research analyst for Doherty and Company. And you know the stock analysts, they say the stock's going to do this, that, or the other. But all of these analysts that are following Tesla, and basically, she's been at odds with all the other analysts all the time. And the difference is she was always right. And they were only right when they agreed with her. And it happens in July 2013. Tesla was trading for $125. And she says, the rest of the analyst says it's going down. And she says, I think it's going to have a target of 200 It hit 200 on February 11th. So... She doesn't do that anymore. She was, she's very young. She was vice president and a senior research analyst. And now she runs her own business, basically telling CEOs how to think the way she thinks. Besides, when she quit, she was able to buy Tesla stock because she knows she can make more money owning the stock than she can telling other people to buy it. And she's in at $201. And incidentally, her next target, as she's looking a little bit ahead, is $1,000. Now, how does she come up with that? Well, what you do is you look at where they are and what their expected growth is going to be. And when you look at that growth, and then you say, okay, if this is their growth and this is their profit, 
and then it's 30 times was the number they used, 30 times price earning, that that brings it to a price at about 2025 of $1,000 is what she figures. So that's pretty interesting. So I told you there's going to be a test. Here's the test. You remember this guy, right? And you remember the very first slide had him, and the last slide had him. Let's see, that's two. How many times did you see him in the whole presentation? Three. Okay, who said four? I said four. Okay, did we have any higher than that? The right answer is six. Where, where is my thing that, um, okay, I, I, you were going to steal that and you're out of luck. You will never see this thing again because your wife's got it. <laughs> Let me show you what Rebecca saw that none of you did. Oh, I don't know how to get back there from this point. Yes, because what happened is remember when we were in Los Angeles and all the cars were going back and forth across? Where was he? In the middle of when those cars were going, he peeked up in the corner like this and then went back down again. <laughs> Good job, Rebecca. You are the star pupil. Huh? Oh, you can ask questions. What name do you look for if you want to buy that battery? Oh, oh, it's just, um, that is really cool. The, um, it's, a, it's a power pack, you know, with uh, two, uh, you know, like I said, I found it on eBay, and it's only like 10, 11 bucks. Well, fine, but does you can pay $16 for it, but no, no. Yes. So you, you mentioned compliance, and I thought that EV1 and, and, and maybe even today, that a lot of manufacturers just build an electric car to make the fleet mileage comply with state regulations. Well, there's that too. There's there's two reasons for build. There's a couple of reasons for building an electric car. One, if you build an electric car, you can say I'm building an electric car and I'm a good guy. Uh, another one is that. The government has fleet mileages that you have to meet. And electric cars obviously drag you way ahead of anything else. But what they're going through is mostly hybrids. And Toyota was trying to go to um, hydrogen. And they currently have abandoned hydrogen for cars, and they're going to use it for semis. And it's a little more practical there. In fact, that semi we saw on the one when all the cars were going back and forth, and you missed. Uh, well, he was in that car three slides, and then I saw him pop up again. Okay. The um, you got five. So. Uh, they're making money on Leaf and and, and Bolt. I mean, you can California, every fifth car is a Leaf or a Bolt. Well, uh, they haven't sold as many as they they liked, and the reason they're making this great deal on the Leaf is because the Gen 2 Leaf is going to be so much better that it's going to be almost impossible to sell a Gen 1 when the Gen 2 comes out. Because we're thinking they might have 200 miles of range. Yes? So one of the things he's always complaining to me about is uh, RFI. Do you use a radio in your electric car? And if so, do you, what kind of interference do you get? Pardon me, honey? What's the answer to that? No, we haven't noticed anything. And people that say that LEDs, you have LED lights and they interfere with your radios? An LED light, it's an LED, they don't interfere with your radio. Unfortunately, the LED lights come with a power supply because they run on 12 volts, and maybe the power supply in the LED light sucks. But I power my LED lights for our ham radio station off of that power supply I built. Yes? 
20,000 milliamp dual USB solar panel battery charger power bank with LED light practical, P-R-A-C-T-I-C-A. That would say that it is 20 ampere hours, and I don't believe there's any yeah. 20 ampere hour batteries like that. I think it's, center. yeah. Okay, so. Can you email that to David Kratz, H at Gmail? Uh, we'll do that. Hey, Norm, I've replaced my uh, Roger door lights. I have two of them on a Chamberlain or a uh -huh. And my remote controls stopped working. Mm -hmm. So I took them out, put regular bulbs in again, or the uh, curly Q and it works fine. So it's actually the LED bulbs and probably the power supply that supplies it, but it interferes with the garage door opener. And I think I have 900 megahertz. Yeah, the it's, latest garage door opener. It, it's, it's the power supply for it. Yeah, it's the power supply. It's not the bulb itself. <laughs> okay, I had another question over here. Yes. Hey, um, <laughs> since the uh, Dayton, uh, Dayton hand mention is, is coming up, they have a, they have a power charging station at the Air Force Museum. Yes. They have a what? A, oh, they've got a, a charging station. electric charging station at oh. the Air Force Museum. We have, destina we have um, destination chargers at the casino. We have them at two different hotels. Yeah, last year at the, oh, at the convention, when I was at the Air Force Museum, there was a, a, a Tesla there that had amateur radio plates on it. And I was always, always curious what the uh, what the yeah, ground on a Tesla was. What I was looking for is we have... No, we would have had it. I missed it. Uh, I added something, and then I didn't get it saved, so I can't show you. <laughs>